And good morning, everyone. And welcome to OSPE's Risk Management Webcast for Life Insurance. I am Stuart McElroy, Senior Director of OSPE's Life Insurance Group. It is my pleasure to be your host today. As we go through the sessions today, you will hear from OSPE specialists on a range of topics that are impacting the life insurance industry today and provide insights on OSPE's planned activities. What I would like to do now is to cover key areas that OSPE will be focusing on over the coming months. Through consultations and supervisory efforts, these are the discussions that you can expect to have with us and likely you are already having with your own companies as well. The key areas we will look at today are IFRS 17 implementation, LICAP modifications for accommodating IFRS 17, climate related prudential risks, and the evolving technology and the associated risks with all this new technology we're getting. Before getting into the specific areas, it makes sense to start this, this discussion with where we find ourselves today. It has been a challenging year for many at home and at work, especially as the dividing lines between the two have blurred throughout the pandemic. The quick shift remote work arrangements required new tools, processes, and governance, all of which place stress and new demands on people and institutions alike. The extraordinary public health measures, uncertain outcomes, and uncertain economic environment are all complicating decision-making. The persistently low interest rates, uncertain, volatile, and uneven business conditions, and growing exposures to non-financial risks are driving actions today that will have long-term impacts. Regarding the impact of COVID-19, we recognize that insurers' financial impact from higher mortality has so far been manageable for the insured population. The initial annuity business experience has had an offsetting influence for the industry. We are all looking forward to the day when the vaccinations will help us return to a more normal and operating environment. However, there is uncertainty of the extent and severity of long-term health and long-term mortality impacts for those that have had COVID-19. The data is sparse and it's still too early to tell if any post COVID-19 health issues will have a material impact for the insurers. It is clear that the economy is experiencing an unusual time. Following the lockdowns and suspension activity with unprecedented job losses, we are now seeing equity markets at or near all-time highs. Credit market spreads had narrowed considerably from their initial burst in March of 2020. Bankruptcies are at very low levels, which is totally unexpected at the beginning of the pandemic. Demand for many products is exceeding the ability of suppliers and supply chains to meet it. And now there are worries on inflation. And employers are having difficulty finding qualified workers, with some employers offering higher wages to attract applicants. We may continue to experience this positive outlook and the favorable expectation may indeed be realized. However, the experience at the beginning of this pandemic has shown how quickly situations and expectations may change. Being a prudential regulator, we have to consider the severe but possible risk of the turn to the downside. There remains broader economic uncertainty and very uneven impacts across different economic sectors and employment groups. There could be secondary impacts of credit and income dislocations from impacted sectors that could affect insurer balance sheets. Through the pandemic, central banks have kept interest rates low. Low rates have a clear impact on insurers' investment income levels. Insurers have been and will likely need to continue to manage the low for longer interest rate environment. OSFI will obviously need to remain watchful of the effectiveness of individual institutions, actions, and the industry's ability to obtain adequate capital to protect policyholders. So we could advance the slide to IFRS 17. 
One of the more significant undertaking, undertakings for both OSFI and the industry is the transition to International Financial Reporting Standard 17, insurance con for insurance contracts. We remain committed to working with the industry and key stakeholders to support a robust IFRS 17 implementation. We have our specialist here today that will be providing a more detailed update, but in brief, IFRS 17 implementation progress reports and LICAP capital discussions were the first initiatives to restart after the suspension of policy development at the beginning of the pandemic. That signifies the importance that we have on this project. We updated our timeline in August last year and set out important details in September. Our plans remain on track and take into consideration the need to allow time for institutions to adapt and prepare their own systems for adoption. We realize that implementing IFRS 17 accounting standards and the associated actuarial calculations is a huge undertaking, especially for life insurance. The new standards create new complexities for the industry to deal with. It is not a simple exercise. OSFI will continue to monitor the progress of institutions towards their adoption of Live for Us 17. And we'll have the industry submitting pro forma financial statements later this year. Please advance slide to like it. It is impossible to talk about accounting changes for insurers in Canada without addressing capital considerations. Our plans have long included making necessary adjustments to our capital guideline to reflect the new standards while committing where possible to limiting the capital impact on a sector-wide basis. The term we are using for this is capital neutrality. There will be a further session later this morning to talk in more detail about our plan to issue draft capital advocacy test guidelines. This will mark the continuation of the discussion on finding the right balance. And we are planning for more engagement on the drafts over the summer before we finalize our expectations. To better inform whether any financial calibration phase in or transitional adjustments are required, we are also launching an industry focused quantitative impact study otherwise known as QIS. We are looking forward to having high quality input provided in this QIS. Having reliable information is important for both OSFI and the industry in finding the right balance with the capital test. This will help in meeting our goal to have a meaningful and manageable industry measure, which is important for all of us. Speaking of capital, one of the, the other issues for the international active Canadian insurers is the ongoing work to develop a global capital, global insurance capital standard, otherwise known as ICS. We support having a robust international capital standard for insurers. However, in its current form, we do not believe it is fit for purpose for the Canadian market and may disadvantage those insurers with long-term business. I will note that as we continue to work with the IAIS and others to find a solution that works in Canada, we are also investigating prudential alternatives that may be a better fit in Canada. For example, the aggregation method advocated by the US is a possible option for us. OSFI is active in international insurance setting organizations, standard setting organizations. And this is one of the discussions we engage in with the, with the IAS and others to help build international expectations and best practices, but with a focus on what works in Canada. I would like to thank those institutions and others who contributed to our discussion paper on climate related risks earlier this year. We had a very enthusiastic response. We received over 70 submissions 
that will help guide our domestic prudential efforts and inform our contributions to the Sustainable Insurance Forum and other international work. While there remains debate about the definitions of green versus brown assets and disclosing the risks associated with them, OSFI is taking an approach of doing its homework within the Canadian and global context. We see this as an essential part of setting the right prudential expectations that will have a positive long-term effect on institutions' resilience. We continue to analyze the input and plan to publish key findings in this September. While we are still early in the process, we have found a few emerging themes from the consultation, including respondents are supportive of OSFI's focus on climate-related risks, Quantifying the impacts of climate-related risks continues to be a topic of interest for many. It was also noted in the submissions, it is important to take into consideration international developments, as well as the Canadian context when looking at climate-related risks. These themes are not surprising. The content and quality of the submissions has demonstrated a desire for action and for more clarity on both implementing measures to address climate change and to improve the measures and transparency around those actions. Moving on to technology. Technology has enabled many firms to continue operations throughout the disruptions of the pandemic. More broadly, technology and digitization has led to new, more efficient processes information gathering and analysis. However, this environment comes with greater exposures to cyber threats, system outages and privacy breaches. Combining this environment with antiquated legacy systems can further increase vulnerabilities. These risks can quickly affect confidence in an institution and perhaps its bottom line. The use of third parties in many aspects of an insurer's operation has grown to significant levels. These arrangements are numerous and diverse, resulting in increased operational complexity. These arrange arrangements can add complexity when dealing with service interruption and possible threats. Hence, this operating environment is increasingly a focus for institutions and for OSFI. The media continues to report on a steady stream of cyber attacks and privacy breaches. Increasingly, these attacks come from sophisticated operators, often with diverse motives. The evolution of technology with ever expanding capabilities brings many benefits, but is not without the associated risks, which has motivated OSFI to publish a discussion paper on technology-related risks in September of 2020. We are seeking to modernize our regulatory and supervisory approach to address this evolving and complex topic. In May, we released a summary of the feedback received and our plan ahead for developing and refining guidance on technology and cyber risk, third-party risk, operational risk and resilience, and finally, model risk. As with any industry, there is a long issue, a long list of issues for them to manage. The agenda here represents the more important issues and the one that OSFI is focused on for the life insurance industry. I have spoken briefly to each of the topics we will cover today and our motivations to bring them to this webcast. For each of these sessions, we have lined up our specialists to provide you with an understanding of where OSCE is focusing its attention and our next steps. I hope you will find them informative. I would now like to introduce David Carrera, our Director in Accounting Policy Division, who will give us an update on IFRS 17 and her plans. David, over to you. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, good morning. Uh, yeah, here we go. 
Uh, I'm the director of OSFI's accounting policy division and uh, also a project manager at, uh, on IFR 17 for OSFI. Uh, as you know, I've mentioned this many times, uh, OSFI's goal is, uh, is a robust implementation of IFR 17 in Canada. And uh, the rationale is to ensure that we have, uh, we meet our mandate of safety and soundness uh, during this very uh, difficult period as we move from uh, a standard we've been comfortable with for a number of years to a international standard. So the measurement uh, and disclosures around the world will be consistent uh, for everybody who reports on IFRS. So let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll uh, begin our presentation. So I accumulated four questions uh, from the industry to open up a dialogue. So. Uh, I will uh, provide the question and then uh, provide the response and then we'll have time at the end uh, to answer additional follow-up questions or other questions you may have about IFR 17 and OSFI's project uh, on this very uh, this transition period in accounting standards. So the four questions are, does OSFI remain on track with its IFR 17 project deliverables? What are OSFI's IFR 17 progress reporting expectations for September 2021? The third question, any update on plans to revisit OSFI guidelines impacted by IFR 17? And the final question I have in this list is, uh, is OSFI planning new performance metrics under IFR 17? What is planned? What is the timing? What is the scope? Um, so let's, Without further ado, let's go to that first question. Let's, let's talk about that, that, uh, that chart on our timeline and our project. So next slide, please. So, so this, you've seen this before. This is OSFI's uh, project plan. We cut out, we started this back in 2017, if anybody remembers. Uh, that's when the standard was supposed to be live by 2021. So I've now cut off all those prior years and all the activities we did uh, before uh, 2020 to focus primarily on where do we go from here. But it's always good to talk about the history, like how do we get here? Um, and uh, so in a nutshell, OSFI's project is on track. But how do we get here? We did the accounting policy stream, that, that green stream, stream along the top. Early days in 2018, we analyzed the standard in detail uh, we looked for areas where it could cause comparability and consistency problems to the framework. And we found in general, uh, there was no issue with consistency and comparability between insurers and we could have a, um, a, a very uh, uniform framework, a, a consistent framework across insurers. And so we issued an advisory in 2018 and a lot of that counting policy questions would also be issue guidance on accounting policy was cleared up back in 2018. Uh, we revised that again when, when the IASB issued a, um, uh, a revision to the standard. And so we, we confirmed the fact that OSI would not be uh, providing policy guidance on, on accounting to the industry. So uh, as well, in the yellow stream, in the yellow stream box is about transition support. These are things that that the industry needs to know as well to help them develop their systems and their processes. We issued the regulatory returns, the final IFRS 17 regulatory returns back in April, which was uh, uh, done with KPM, like all the auditors, I'm not gonna just name one, uh, but all the auditors were involved in that. We involved the industry in some detail. We did a public consultation. So the, the regulatory returns are final, they're published uh, the templates are published on the, on the website. We have been working tirelessly with the CIA to have actual application guidance, to have it consistent and, thought, and thoughtful so that we don't, we don't react to it afterwards. We, are, we have been doing that. And so that has been an ongoing effort and that's near coming to conclusion as well. So, the, the, so that's, that's the past. We've also done Capital policy, we've also communicated with you a number of times in terms of where our capital policy and where that guidance is going. Tom uh, Sarazan is, is going to speak to that in a little bit. Uh, but where are we now and where are we going? So where we are now in June, uh, this month, we are going to issue the quiz. Uh, Stuart mentioned it. 
uh, I will talk to it in, in a little more detail in the next question, but we are gonna issue a quiz and this is a one office quiz. It touches on not only uh, accounting and supervision, it touches on capital, the LICAD, and it touches on sensitivity testing for actuarial. So there, it's, a, it's a one bulk quiz. This is fatal flaw, meaning this is the last time you will see a quiz on, uh, on LICAD. And this is a requirement for all institutions. This will be a very big milestone in the project. Um, so that's coming up next. After that, the next touch point on this is June 2022, something we've been calling the test run. And that is really a test run of 2021. That will be a test run of 2021 data. Uh, and that'll be a, a bigger balance sheet and a, a full test of the LICAT in terms of any changes that happen because of the quiz, any minor edits that were done, that will be run through the entire industry in 2022. And, in, in, and so in, in 2023, also will require an opening balance sheet as well. So those are the next three major, major milestones from the industry that will put additional pressure, uh, but will keep everybody on track for that robust implementation to meet safety and soundness. So let's go to the next slide and talk about the second question. So the second question was uh, the, the progress reporting expectation for September, 2021. So until now, the, 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 the advisory that OSFI has, has been, um, you know, provide us your plans, uh, give me a self-assessment questionnaire, and we will follow up if there's anything uh, uh, concerning. So we, we've, we've been doing that. We've been doing that since uh, 2018, and that's worked very effectively. Uh, but now in September 2021, we're, we're asking for a level setting exercise. We, we want quantitative data on the financial statements. Uh, so we're looking for a pro forma set of financial statements, IFRS 4 versus 17, uh, uh, income statement and balance sheet. And we're also looking for a letter of attestation from the CFO and the appointed actuary on the quality of the submission. So we are going to uh, be stepping up in terms of, so we can get some comfort on the transition point. And, um, and as a reminder, this is an externally imposed deadline. We cannot move the deadline and it is fast approaching. Let's go to the next slide. So, why are we doing this? Many people ask, like, why is OSFI asking for this, this uh, pro forma set of financial statements? Well, really, it's really three things. Uh, the information will provide OSFI with data on top line. What are the volumes? How do the volumes change between four and 17? One's written premium, one's revenue. So that's a, that's a, that's a big change. And we want to know what that top line looks like. We also want to, look, want to know what the bottom line looks like. The, the profitability of insurers and in the industry is, is important to OSFI as well. And so we want to know what that bottom line looks like. And finally, uh, and what you're used to is the balance sheet strength. And we're, we're going to get that data as well in the summary balance sheet, four versus 17. So that's, that's critical to us. The, the, uh, another, another important part is that we're only three months away from the transition comparable period. So uh, in uh, September, 2021, which is only three months away from where we are now, we're gonna have um, a, a set of financial statements from you that will guide us into the comparable period in 2022. So if we need to adjust or make changes or, or have discussions with institutions, that's when we're gonna have it. We're gonna have it during that comparable period in 2022. So, so at the transition point, Jan 1, 2023, we're ready to go. We're, we're, we're on, on solid ground. Um, and the third point I want to make is the importance of finalizing those accounting policy decisions. Um, and it will help us understand where the, the, the institutions are, if there's comparability and consistency problems. So we self assess we assessed the standard way back in 2017, 2018. And our analysis indicated that there would not be a comparability and consistency problem. We have not tested that with the industry. We don't find that, we don't think that will be a problem, but let's, let's, you know, let's look at the data 
uh, and the quantitative data uh, will help us finalize and, and lock that down. So let's go to the next slide. So the, this is the third question. Um, OSCE's guidelines. So there's a number of OSCE guidelines out there that mention the word IFRS 4 or IS39 or COM. What's going to happen to those? Well, well, in short, uh, they're they're going to be amended, and uh, you know, find replace uh, or deleted. And so we've done a review of all the guidelines, letters, advisories, etc. That that have mentioned the these words in the past and anything that that trips over them. And we've done this uh, full analysis, and then we're going to go to the industry in the fall uh, or late summer with the, all the changes for a consultation with the industry. So this is what we're deleting. Uh, this is what we're amending and uh, for any thoughts uh, on, those, on those changes. So there should not be, it's gonna be a short consultation period because we don't expect very many comments. Most of it's we're gonna delete uh, ad advisories and guidelines that are no longer applicable because IFRS 4 doesn't exist, won't exist anymore. But uh, we are going to, in the, in the importance of communication, we are going to the industry in, uh, in by the fall of 2021 with a, a consultation. And let's go to that last question. Uh, so the final question is, is with respect to metrics. Uh, and so Aussie has been working on the new metrics. So we, we, we saw this opportunity with the changing in the regulatory returns and the changing disclosures that would be great to have a common, a common language. And the common language would be this IFRS 17 language between supervisors and the industry. And so uh, because of the disaggregation of policyholder liabilities and the liability roll forwards and, and, um, and the different income statement, we could create new metrics off of these regulatory returns that the industry would automatically know this is what the supervisor is looking for and this is what, they're, what they, they want. And an OSCE would have the common language, by the way, you know, I've used this particular metric and uh, there'd be less burden in, in, uh, uh, from the industry because they would know what we're looking at and um, there'd be less work and effort at uh, OSCE in order to try to, you know, uh, provide you with uh, two weeks in advance notice that we're going to be looking at a certain level of data. So we're developing this common language with the CLHIA working group, and uh, we're moving forward with that. So we hope to have that ready uh, in, uh, in late 2021, uh, early 2022, so that we can move forward with these, this common set of metrics so we can reduce burden within the industry. And so uh, that's my last slide. Uh, I will be available to answer questions later. Uh, Thomas Sarazan from Austin's Capital Division will be presenting next. Uh, and um, I will give it over to Tom. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this portion of the webcast on the life insurance capital IADC test. Uh, as David mentioned, my name is Thomas Sarazin, and I'm a director in Ausfis Capital Division. As David previously mentioned or discussed, uh, there are important changes coming to life insurer financial accounting arising from the adoption of IFRS 17 in 2023. One of the key implications of these changes is their impact on regulatory capital. I suspect that for many of you listening today, capital is an important consideration in your day-to-day -day activities and as part of your decision-making, as if you work in capital management, actuarial pricing, or risk management. So this next 15 minutes is really dedicated to you. I'll go over what OSFI is doing to adjust the LICAT in response of IFRS 17, and we'll be happy to take questions at the very end of this session. Next slide, please. Let's begin with OSFI's objective in updating LICAT. As David mentioned earlier, OSFI fully supports IFRS 17 and is committed to supporting the industry in the robust implementation of the standard. Now, from a capital perspective, to support this objective, we're really doing two things. One is that we're going to continue with LICAT being an accountant-based test, meaning that we will not, or meaning that we 
insurers will continue to calculate regulatory capital requirements based on accounting models. So there won't be any statutory uh, accounting or uh, requirement for insurers to do two sets of books. Also, we're adjusting the IFRS 17. When adjusting uh, LICAT for IFRS 17, what we've committed to do is to maintain the current capital policies intact. Now, of course, to the extent that it's prudent to do so. With those commitments, what we expect is that industry capital on an aggregate basis is planned to be a minimal. So here, what we want to do is to maintain the same amount of capital in the system pre-IFRS 17 and post-IFRS 17. Now, that said, given that the number of changes that are coming from IFRS 17, it will not be possible to ensure that the LICAT, which is a standard capital test, to be capital neutral on an individual insurer basis. So, so far, there's a lot of work that's been done to update LICAT for IFRS 17. Um, updates includes we've updated methodologies. For example, we've um, changed, uh, we've adjusted the LICAT to accommodate for the new element of IFR 17, the contractual service margin, which will be added to tier one capital. We've updated our methodologies on geography allocation. Uh, we've also, outside of the methodologies, has updated our guidance material. So we've updated the 20, uh, 2013 LICAT guideline. We've also con conducted many consultations as, as Stuart alluded to in his opening remarks, as well as um, uh, several quantitative impact studies. The infographic that you're seeing on the page now sets out the timeline for the updates that are specific to capital in the LICAT 2023. It was last updated uh, in a letter that we published to industry uh, in September of 2020. I won't go into all of the details of this infographic as they'll speak to some of the timelines in the next slides. But what I can mention now is that there are no further updates that are planned to this timeline. Next slide, please. So the last draft of the first version of LICAT for IFRS 17 was tested between September and December of last year. At this point, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of the insurers that participated in the testing and for their very helpful comments. We've gone through the results and at a high level, what our analysis shows is that on a total industry basis is that capital ratios under IFRS 17 would be expected to go down. And this is compared to current capital ratios. That said, there are a few caveats that I should mention in respect of this high level result. One is that the um, results are a point in time estimate and more uh, importantly relied on dry IFRS 17 accounting policies. This means that come 2023, the results that we saw in quiz two may not persist on implementation. We also note that the results varied by insurers and depending on the risk profile. So for some insurers, the results, individual results were better than the industry total. And for other insurers, industry results were lower than the industry total. And finally, we also want to note that the um, not all insurers calculated the base solvency buffer under the new version of LICAT. Um, and this was because we provided an option for insurers to either use the base solvency buffer under the new version of the LICAT for 2023 being tested, or at the time, the version of the base solvency buffer under LICAT 2019. The reason was, was we wanted to provide a little bit more flexibility for insurers in the wake of implications of COVID-19. Uh, COVID now, the main driver for the results, as we've done further analysis, um, are, are, are a few. Um, the first one is uh, changes to discount rates. We also identified changes to the cost of guarantee of liability calculations, and also the loss of the C3 PFAD in the surplus allowance. Now, all of these amounts affect the numerator of the car capital ratio. Um, as I mentioned earlier, not all insurers recalculated the base solvency buffer, but through the analysis of quiz two results, uh, we observed that the uh, BSB remained stable uh, between the new version of the LICAT in the LICAT 2019. Next slide, please. 
As I mentioned earlier, we received a lot of very good comments uh, during quiz two, and they were very helpful and have led to certain adjustments to the LICATS, which will be tested in quiz three. Uh, one good example of that will be the comments that we received on the re on reinsurance capital guidance. Um, on those comments, we've made some edits to that area of the test to make it a little bit more simpler. I'll expand a little bit more on the quiz C in the next slide, but first I'd like to touch on still some outstanding issues uh, that we've identified through quiz two. The first one would be capital neutrality. Um, based on the high level results, uh, there is an indication that IFRS 17 and the current version of the draft LICAT 2023 wouldn't lead to capital neutrality. Um, further analysis has also shown that in the area of interest rates, our capital policies may not be uh, remained intact based on the current draft. So what we were planning to do for quiz three is we're going to test the impact of additional scalers uh, in the capital test. These additional scalers um, will be, one will be applied to the interest rate capital requirements and will be lower than one, bringing down the requirement for interest rates. The addition, second additional scalar is really not an additional scalar, but more of a revision to the existing scalar of 5% that applies to the overall BSP. Here, uh, we, again, we're revising or testing the impact of a revision downward to the scalar. It's very important to note though, that these scalars that will be tested as part of QUIST 3 are not final and they're subject to some final calibration. Another big concern and in, in something that is still on our radar is volatility under IFRS 17 and under uh, LICAT. For this reason, we've tested through sensitivity tests, uh, potential volatility results uh, through quiz two. The high level uh, outcome of this test showed that there isn't really that much of higher volatility under this new version of the LICAT. That said, we understand that this is a point, was a point in time uh, test based on specific um, stress scenarios. So we, what we've decided is we'll continue to monitor the volatility closely through additional sensitivity testing in quiz three. We'll also consider whether uh, for the final version of the test, whether a smoothing mechanism should be implemented. Um, finally, we've also looked at the discount rate. Um, discount rate range of practice. Here, what we've observed through Chris to is a wide range of practice. Uh, we've brought the results to the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, the accounting, the accounting standards boards, and we'll continue monitoring this through quiz three again. Our hope is that we prefer a narrow range of practice for discount rates come 2023. Next slide, please. So, Speaking, extending on quiz three, quiz three, as David mentioned, will launch in June. Um, it'll be a public consultation. It'll be, and the public version of it will be a guidelines, the guideline, the LICAC guideline in its associated forms only. It will be the last quiz before the finalization of LICAT for IFR 17. Here, it's very important to stress as my both colleagues, David and Stuart have said, is we expect high quality results for the quiz. These are needed to answer the big questions that we just spoke about in respect of neutrality and volatility. As David mentioned again, the quiz will be a one office, uh, one office quiz, and we'll have a direct package directly to insurers, which will consist of the LICAT 2023 regulatory forms, as well as accounting and other actuarial components. You should expect to receive the quiz uh, by mid-June. The timeline for the implementation of the quiz elements or the submission of the quiz elements is set out on this slide. We've provided some staggered um, due dates in order to provide some flexibility to insurers in conducting the quiz. Following the quiz, um, we'd like to note that there will be an ana analyst call shortly after the publication of the draft on OSFI's website, so expected to be at the end of June. And we will also host some webinars on LICAT 2023 in both July and August to help communicate the changes, uh, not only to insurers, but to all stakeholders. Insurers will be invited to their webinar and should receive their invitation shortly. 
Uh, before concluding on the LICAT 2023, I'd like to say a few words on the segregated fund guarantees and how they will be treated in this 2020 version of 2023 version of the LICAT. Up until a month ago, we were still aiming to implement a completely new approach for determining segregated fund guarantee risk capital. Um, and now, given some feedback that we've gotten from the industry, um, what we've decided to do is extend the timeline to beyond 2023. Uh, the reason being is that we want to allow insurers to focus on the robust implementation of IFRS 17. So what this means for segregated funds in 2023, a version of the LICAD, is that we need to make similar adjustments to where we've made adjustments in the other areas in the test in order to make the LICAD compatible to IFRS 17. So here specifically, a few areas to note is that uh, for the base solvency buffer, the, what we're going to do is we're going to maintain the calculation of the total gross calculated requirement. So that means that that measure quantum will be determined the same way as it's determined today, either by using a factor-based methodology that's in Chapter 7 of the LICAT, or if approved by OSFI, the insurer's own internal models. The difference between now and IFRS 17 is that the methodology to calculate the capital requirements will incorporate the IFRS 17 total liability. So the IFRS 17 total liability will come and replace the COM liability. Um, for available capital, um, the, um, the IFRS 17 will also, liability will also replace the COM liability. The key consideration here is, as we've done in other areas, areas of the LICAT, is to achieve neutrality. We believe that with this approach on a total um, balance sheet requirement, that neutrality can be achieved between 23 and 25, 2025, when the new standard approach will be uh, uh, planned to be implemented. This new instrument methodology will be tested in the June quiz and will be uh, consulted on at the same time. The next steps for segregated fund is that we are going to postpone the quiz five of the new approach that we had originally planned for September 2021. We're now busy looking at revising the project plan for the implementation of this new approach, which will be in 2025. And we'll continue to work with the steps that we were undertaking before granting the deferral. So i.e. we're not pausing the work on this approach. We're keep on we're can just con continue on keep going and we are going to uh, but uh, defer the implementation by 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 one year. And once we've, uh, sorry, not by one year, by two years. Once we've finalized the updates to our project plan, uh, we will consult with industry uh, on a revised plan to get their feedback. So this concludes uh, the portion on the LICAT or the remarks that I want to make. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions during the, uh, the final se session of this webcast. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time. And with that, I'll cede the mic to Teresa Hine, who will provide a update on risk management policy initiatives. Okay, good morning. <clears throat> so thank you. Thomas, my name is Teresa Hins, and I lead the Prudential Policy and Strategic Policy Liaison Teams at OSFI. Before I, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Before I provide an overview of current policy initiatives, I'd like to highlight a few enhancements to the policy development process at OSFI over the last couple of years. An important element in developing our current policies is the OSFI three-year strategic plan. The strategic plan was initially launched in 2019 and you can access it on OSFI's website. It's a very good read. The strategic plan sets out four key areas of focus, financial institutions management of financial risk and non-financial risk, OSFI's own agility and operational effectiveness and enhancing OSFI's accountability to stakeholders through increased transparency, consultations and communications. These four strategic goals have played an important role in shaping the content and method for developing prudential policy over these last few years. For example, to increase transparency of OSFI's policymaking processes, we published a forward policy plan last September, and again recently in May. 
This will be an annual publication, likely in the spring, which coincides with the beginning of Aussie's fiscal year and annual priority setting. The forward policy plan also sets out principles that guide OSFI in determining policy priorities. Additionally, we are relying increasingly on engaging with stakeholders on emerging policy issues through the use of discussion papers, for example, the reinsurance review, and the recent technology risk and climate risk discussion papers, industry information sessions, and roundtables. By doing so, we aim to achieve prudential policy that is responsive, transparent, and fit for purpose. Next slide, please. Thank you. A few highlights on recent non-financial management policy work. OSFI's discussion paper on technology and related risks was published in September 2020 with a three-month consultation that ended mid-December. The paper was very broad in scope and covered several areas of technology, including cyber, third-party risk, artificial intelligence, and data. You'll hear more about this a little bit later from my colleague Mo. The consultation confirmed broad support for OSFI's emerging principles-based and technology-neutral perspectives on technology risk management as presented in the discussion paper. This May, OSFI published Next Steps and a summary of respondent feedback following that consultation. We have received a number of questions related to B10 outsourcing. Of note, we will be reviewing, amending, and recasting B10 as a guideline on third-party risk. This is also a result of the third-party risk analysis completed through 219 and 220. The results of that analysis was available, excuse me, is available on OSFI's website. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in this slide, you can see the various non-financial risk guideline initiatives with the associated specific timelines. OSFI is working to develop draft non-financial risk guidance, including technology risk for further consultation. This will include publishing a new draft guideline on technology risk management for consultation later this fall, issuing an industry letter on operational resilience this summer in advance of revising guideline E21 on operational risk management in 2022-2023, as just mentioned, revising guideline B10 on third-party risk for consultation early next year, and releasing an industry letter on advanced analytics and model risk as an interim step toward risk model guidance in 2022 and 2023. Next slide, please. Thank you. Climate-related risks. Ask, um, so OSFI's discussion paper on climate-related risks was published in January 2021 with a three-month consultation period that ended mid-April. We are currently analyzing the results of the consultation and will publish a summary of respondent feedback and OSFI's plan for continued work in this area. Through this process, as well as our original or our ongoing internal research and strategic review, we are looking at all the tools at our disposal to explore how climate related risk could affect financial institutions and determine the appropriate regulatory and supervisory actions. My colleague Stefan. We'll speak more about this in a couple of minutes and other initiatives that are being carried out at OSFI at this time. Next slide, please. Thank you. So a final risk management policy initiative that I'd like to highlight is OSFI's reinsurance review and revisions to guideline B3. Two years ago, OSFI launched a reinsurance review with the issuance of a discussion paper. In that paper, we noted a number of issues that largely related to PNC insurance. However, guideline B3, sound reinsurance practices and procedures, which applies to both life and PC insurance was due for an update as it was last revised in 210. In June, 2019, OSFI issued a draft revised guideline B3 for public consultation. 
Following the pause in policy work due to the pandemic, the reinsurance review was relaunched in November 2021. We have since had several discussions with industry associations and individual insurance companies. OSFI intends to issue final guide, guideline B3 by December 2021, and we will subsequently hold industry information sessions. It is taking a bit more time than expected, as there are other parts that relate to the PNC industry and updating guideline B2, dealing with PC large exposure limits. Uh, so that ends my pr uh, presentation on policy today. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Stefan Tadif, who will discuss work being done uh, in, in Austria, as I mentioned, relative to climate-related risks, and happy to take any questions that you may have later. Thank you for your time today, Stefan. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and I'd like to thank my colleagues in the life insurance sector for inviting me to speak today. I just realized yesterday that this is my third year in a row presenting on climate risks, and I'm uh, really pleased with the progress that we're making and I'm happy to share with, with you today uh, where we are on this important topic. Um, I have a lot of content to cover. Uh, probably won't be able to go into a lot of detail on some of the material. I did provide a lot more in the deck so that you could uh, look at those at your own uh, pace. But I do welcome questions in the Q&A session following this presentation and also uh, invite people to send me an email if uh, they'd like me to go into uh, more detail on a particular topic. So next slide, please. I'm going to uh, touch on uh, quickly uh, a quick update on our climate risk project at OSFI. Uh, a few words around our discussion paper, um, the scenario analysis, and I also plan to spend most of my time speaking about a couple of important topics that uh, garner a lot of attention with our stakeholders, namely disclosures, capital, and data and taxonomy issues. Next slide, please. So our, our climate risk work at OSFI is really focused on an approach uh, similar to many of our other initiatives that it really includes uh, uh, active engagement with our stakeholders, our, our institutions, um, work on analysis and, and policy work. And really the work over the next couple of years is really focused on, I would say, these sort of five key objectives that I have on the screen now. Uh, namely, uh, a lot of work is going on in terms of quantifying climate related risks. So really trying to understand and size how material these risks are for the financial sector. Uh, following from this, there's a lot of work going on in terms of assessing the vulnerabilities, both at the institution level, uh, the federally regulated financial institutions that we regulate, as well as the uh, private pension plans that we regulate, um, as well as individual sectors uh, that our institutions operate on. So there's a vulnerability assessment uh, that needs to happen uh, following a following the quantification work that we're doing. Uh, in parallel, we also are developing a regulatory response. Uh, the discussion paper uh, that Teresa mentioned and I'll speak to in a few moments is a good example of that regulatory response. Uh, following from that, we will have to develop supervisory expectations. Uh, we've already slowly started introducing that, but those will really follow once we have uh, articulated our regulatory prudential uh, response. And underpinning all of this work is uh, uh, ensuring that OSFI is, uh, has the appropriate organizational capacity and readiness uh, uh, to deal with climate change uh, in, the years, in the years to come. So that's just a quick update uh, on, on the, the, the project uh, at OSFI. And I'd also like to say that we have uh, created a dedicated team uh, within the organization to lead this effort. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of attention on, on climate risks. Uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you. So just a couple, couple of words on this scenario uh, pilot exercise that we're doing with the Bank of Canada. I think a lot of people are probably aware of this. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of publications and announcements on this, but we, we did launch a, uh, a joint exercise with the Bank of Canada back in November. Uh, a scenario exercise that really is allowing us to better understand the climate-related risks to the economy and to the financial sector uh, related to transition risks. So this is the transition to a low or a net zero carbon economy by 2050, and what would be the economic implications and financial sector implications of that transition. Um, we will be publishing a report at the end of the year, probably late November, early December, with findings and lessons learned from this exercise. 
as well as the, we will be making all the scenarios uh, available publicly, the methodology, uh, all the data, uh, all the economic uh, data. Uh, so it, it'll be sort of like a playbook, uh, a playbook of sorts uh, that would allow institutions to individually run, uh, run those scenarios on their own with very little intervention uh, needed from, from OSFI or from the bank. Uh, so far, I can share that we've, we've got some pretty interesting lessons learned from the, from the exercise so far. Uh, some of them relate to the fact that the scenarios really show that it's important for the government to articulate timely and clear policies around how the government is going to move to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, in Canada. So these early signals from the government are extremely important uh, in order to allow for a gradual transition to a lower carbon economy. Um, what we notice in the scenarios is that if the, if, the, uh, if the policy actions happen too late, like let's say at 2030 or 2040, uh, there's a risk of a very abrupt disorderly transition on the economy and ultimately uh, with our financial institutions. Um, we're also learning a lot about the, the challenges of implementing these, these scenarios and running the models uh, within the individual institutions. Uh, there's a lot of issues around standardization of data, de data definitions, uh, issues around uh, risk ratings. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, still a lot of um, capacity to learn about how to, to exercise these, these scenarios and these models at the institution. So the pilot has been, in, if anything, uh, the, the, the big lesson learned is about how to operationalize these scenarios at the institution level. So. Uh, keep an eye out for the report uh, later this year, where we will articulate uh, all, all the lessons learned in, in detail. Next slide, please. Thank you. So on the discussion paper, uh, it's been mentioned a few times already today, but um, we had uh, an extremely valuable uh, consultation period, uh, which closed in April. Uh, we will be publishing a uh, summary of all that feedback, uh, uh, sort of an anonymized uh, thematic feedback report that will be published in September, uh, and at which point we're probably also going to um, articulate some sort of expectations for um, probably a letter uh, sometime in January, uh, which may be followed by some, some more consultations. So we're definitely, uh, I wouldn't say we're in the final stretch, but the consultation period and the discussion paper provide us a lot of feedback. And I think we're gonna be in a good position probably early fall um, to, to share some of that feedback with you and also to share our next steps. Next slide, please. In terms of the, uh, some of the feedback, I, I, I'm happy to share uh, at a very high level. I, I think Stuart also mentioned a few things, but um, it was, it was quite uh, unanimous in terms of the feedback, in terms of institutions acknowledging the importance of starting to manage, need to manage climate-related risks and, and embed climate-related risks in existing, uh, you know, uh, enterprise risk management frameworks and governance frameworks. Um, the institutions are, are, are quick to point that it's, uh, many companies are, you know, beginning this journey and it's still early days. Um, and they articulate uh, pretty, pretty consistently the challenges around the availability of you know, decision-ready data and analytical tools to help quantify uh, climate-related risks, you know, transition risks in particular, um, and the lack of you know, common definitions and, and a taxonomy um, and, and inconsistent measurement methods and inconsistent definitions of metrics. Uh, so, this was a very, very consistent message that we got from our institutions across all sectors and something that uh, is, is, is playing a big role in our, in our, in our work at OSFI. And I'll speak a little bit about that uh, in my next couple of topics. In terms of the, um, we did get some very good feedback from the life insurance industry. I'd like to share with you that uh, the life insurance industry and some of the companies pointed out that uh, in our discussion paper, we did not highlight uh, the risk to public health you know, the implications to morbidity and mortality assumptions that climate change can, can uh, impart. Uh, you know, climate change can negatively impact health uh, and life expectancy, uh, issues around respiratory health, um, you know, heat-related deaths, uh, the increase of uh, vector-borne diseases. You know, all this was, uh, was not included in our discussion paper. And I think it was very, very good feedback and something that will be reflected in our work 
uh, going forward as one of the as one of the risks that we we didn't uh, we didn't point out. So I'd like to thank all those who contributed to that to that feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Slide thirty three. Um, just quickly, I, I do get a lot of questions. Also, you know, we get a lot of questions from our from our institutions and our stakeholders about what uh, what are our expectations, and uh, we're we're asking institutions and the industry to be patient as we as we, as our thinking evolves and uh, as we try to align our 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 planned expectations along with what are some of the international standard setters are are putting out as well in the fall. But you know, in the absence of formal guidance or expectations. You know, we believe that, uh, as we discussed in our discussion paper, the current expectations that we have around uh, governance, uh, strategy development, risk management, are already pretty important pillars in terms of building financial resilience to climate-related risks, as, as well as other risks. But they fit. You know, climate risks fits well within those within those frameworks and those expectations already. So we do. You know, we would expect institutions to take a forward-looking approach to identifying climate risks and trying to quantify those risks, notwithstanding the challenges that I mentioned earlier, but you know, how do climate related risks fall into your risk profile, your investment strategy, your capital management strategy, uh, you know, and how do they fall into discussions around your ORSA and your own you know, internal capital target settings and own capital adequacy. So I think we're at a point now where uh, notwithstanding some of the data challenges, methodology channels, uh, challenges and metrics, uh, we would expect institutions to start thinking about uh, how climate related risks and, and for the life insurance industry, how those transition risks on the credit side and on the, on the uh, capital market side would affect your, your businesses. Slide 34, please. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, just shift quickly on, a, on just to touch on a couple of topics that we get a lot of uh, questions on in, in different forms. And the first one is on disclosures. Disclosures is a very uh, fluid and very rapidly evolving topic when it comes to climate risks. There's a lot of pressure uh, to mandate disclosures and make them mandatory, uh, particularly along the TCFD framework. Some jurisdictions are going that way. You know, the UK comes to mind. Um, some other jurisdictions in Europe. France has passed a law making climate risk disclosures mandatory for all companies. And there's a lot of you know competing and voluntary frameworks that people are signing up for, and you know we did hear in our consultation that this is providing a little bit of confusion for for market participants. Uh, next slide, please. But I would say that um, uh, you know from what I'm seeing, there seems to be a lot of momentum uh, for the IFRS move to create an international sustainability reporting standards board under the governance of the IFRS Foundation. And um, I'm not sure if anybody saw the communique that came out on the weekend following the uh, G7 uh, meetings in the UK, but there was a lot of uh, comments in that communique around supporting a move towards a mandatory climate related disclosure framework uh, that provides consistent and decision useful information. And they particularly referenced the TCFD, you know, the, you know, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure Framework. Um, and it was also a lot of comments about the need to develop, you know, global baseline reporting standards for sustainability and sustainable financing. And they also specifically mentioned the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation work to develop that baseline standard. Um, so I think it was a big win for the IFRS. And I think that uh, probably by COP26 in November, um, I would expect to see um, that that sustainability standards board uh, stood up by the IFRS. Uh, so if anybody is, 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 if anybody is still on the fence around financial disclosures or, or climate risk related financial disclosures and the TCFD framework, um, I would suggest that now is probably a good time to start familiarizing yourself with that, with that framework. Now, as we noted in our discussion paper, you know, we're looking at climate, the role that climate related disclosures can play as part of our prudential approach but our focus here is really around the management of, of prudential risks. And we, you know, similar to a lot of other regulators and a lot of standards, uh, a lot of different authorities around the world, you know, we do recognize the value of disclosures for many, many different purposes. But we also recognize that to get meaningful financial disclosures, you know, we have to address the challenges around the data, the complexity of the methodologies, trying to quantify 
uh, climate risks and 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 having standard definitions and how we how we quantify the the mapping of those risks through different transmission channels and understanding how the impact institutions and 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 financial stability as a whole. So for us, sometimes when the discussion is always focused on disclosures, we feel it's a little bit like putting the cart in front of the horse. Uh, we're trying to really get to, the, to the, the understanding how those risks manifest themselves through the, through the system and the institutions and how they're being managed. Um, but I, I want people to understand that we do recognize the importance of disclosures, but um, there's a lot of other associations, for example, the, the um, the, uh, the the capital markets uh, reporting standards, you know, that are, that are going to be focusing on these disclosures, uh, the securities regulators, for example, that it's not really in the in the place for OSFI to comment too much on on climate risk disclosures at this point until until those standards are set. Next slide, please. So, in terms of uh, another topic that we get a lot of questions around is uh, is capital. And uh, we get a lot of questions around capital requirements, and and I understand this pressure. You know, there's there's a there's a lot of societal pressure, political pressure, for the financial industry to help deliver on that transition to a low carbon economy by channeling capital flows towards sustainable activities and new technologies, you know, to help meet those near net zero emission targets. But and there's also a lot of pressure. There's you know I'm seeing more and more pressure uh, for institutions to join. Uh, commitments or alliances to net zero. Uh, for example, the recently announced uh, UN convened net zero banking alliance, where a lot of uh, banks around the world are joining alliances and committing to net zero by 2050. And you've also got jurisdictions and different authorities uh, that are pursuing an active transition and actually using prudential tools like capital uh, for you know, directly uh, influencing and incentivizing capital allocation to achieve uh, broader climate policy goals. You know, the Europe is a good example where we're seeing some of this activity where they're you know incorporating uh, green discounts into their capital frameworks by 2025. And the European Bank Authority has is looking at you know ESG factors and how they can be incorporated into Pillar One risk weights. You know, so there's a lot happening in different jurisdictions, but at us, um, slide 38, please, next slide. But, you know, I just want to reiterate that in, for OSFI, uh, we do not, and, and we're not alone here, there's a number of other regulators that feel the same way, that, you know, we don't feel that it's appropriate to use regulatory capital requirements uh, to set, uh, uh, you know, uh, net zero or, or climate risk uh, uh, goals and to try to meet those goals. You know, for us, regulatory capital must be based on the risks underlying those assets and supporting the capital for that institution. You know, there's considerable investment risk here at play for institutions. You know, governments are setting firm targets for greenhouse gas emissions, but it's really unclear which technologies or business models work, are, are gonna get us there. You know, will the grid of the future be run on sun, on solar, on nuclear? You know, how big of a role will carbon capture and sequestering play? We don't know. Um, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the situation with electrical vehicles and uh, will there be competition from hydrogen fuel cells, for example, you know, all these, all these technologies fall under the green umbrella, the sustainable umbrella, but it doesn't mean that they all have the same risk profile. So for us, you know, there may come a time when we will have more credible data and this will be based on, you know, established taxonomies and data definitions. And then maybe we'll be able to inform our capital considerations, but we're not there yet. There's still some ways to go. So I just want to make it clear that you know that's that's Oscar's position is not to use capital uh, to incentivize uh, uh, different industries or disincentivize different industries in order to meet broader policy uh, net zero ambitions. Uh, ne next slide, please. And uh, we've probably go to the next slide. I'm, I'm done with the capital. So I think slide 39, thank you very much. So um, I won't go into, into this slide into too much detail, but I just wanted to put a couple of points for, for, uh, for you in terms of data and taxonomy. We are definitely hearing that one of the top challenges is the availability of relevant data 
uh, uh, decision ready data around around uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions and uh, and we understand that there's difficulty in, in aligning those those analytical tools and methodologies to help institutions quantify their exposures to climate related risks we're seeing this currently now on the scenario pilot and this is something that's echoed uh, globally across different authorities but the message is is that this should not discourage you from at least getting started thinking about how climate related risks uh, uh, can be incorporated there are you know the the it, there's it's just a rapidly evolving field there's more and more models becoming available credit risk models market risk models that are starting to incorporate uh, climate related risks and transition risks and I would encourage institutions to start doing their research in terms of how that can be can be leveraged um, and you know, there's a lot of uh, if you if you do reading a reading on on or research on taxonomies and data, you'll see that in Europe, uh, there's a lot of progress being made. I mean, they've 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 come out. The EU has come out with a a sustainability taxonomy, um, and they're now passing legislation uh, for for companies to report on that taxonomy by by 2022. But it's important to understand that taxonomies can sometimes be jurisdictional specific. And whatever taxonomy we are going to adopt in or develop in Canada has to be um, uh, in the context of the Canadian economy and, and our particular um, uniqueness of our, of our jurisdiction. And it also has to be flexible that it can evolve as approaches uh, you know, evolve over the next couple of years. So um, there's, I, we understand, and it came through clear on the discussion paper, your consultation feedback, around the challenges, but I am very encouraged by the recently announced Sustainable Finance Action Council that was announced a few weeks ago by the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Environment. Uh, they've, uh, there are several senior uh, life insurance executives who are going to be on that council. The first meeting is uh, scheduled for this Friday. Uh, OSFI is an observer uh, in that, in that uh, organization as well. And one of their first priorities uh, as part of their sustainable mandate and sustainable finance mandate, but one of their first priorities is to look at disclosures, taxonomies, and, and data. So I'm very, very encouraged. I think there's gonna be some very positive developments by that industry-led council that's gonna be making recommendations to the federal government. So with that, I probably went a little bit over time. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to any questions. And as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to send me an email if you'd like to discuss some of these, any of these topics in more detail. I'll now pass it on to my colleague, Mo Albustami for his perspectives on technology and cyber risks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. And I hope everyone can hear me okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening if anyone is joining us uh, from Asia Pacific. My name is Mohammed al Bustami, or Mo, and I am the Managing Director of the Technology Risk Division at OSFI. Thank you for having me today, as I will be speaking about perspectives on technology and cyber risks. The next slide shows a high-level agenda of the items I will be speaking on. I will start by giving a quick background on the Technology Risk Division, who we are and what we do. Then I will talk a little bit about the team's direction. As you heard earlier, OSFI is developing a technology and cyber guideline. I will also talk a little bit about some other tools we recently developed, issued, or plan to use. Then I will shift focus to speak a little bit about the current trends in the cyber threat landscape. I will end my remarks with a brief look at some notable incidents that we received via our tech and cyber incident advisory and share some observed trends across insurance. Next slide, please. Before I start talking about the technology division, a little history lesson could be helpful. Back in 2018, OSFI made a decision to increase focus on the areas of non-financial risks. This was accomplished by doing a reset in our risk support sector. The reset included creating a couple of new teams under the umbrella of non-financial risks or NFR. These include creating a team focused on culture and compliance risk called CCRD. The second team was operational risk division or ORD, which was pre established pre-reset. And finally, the technology risk division. The next slide zooms in on TRD. The team was announced as part of the reset, as I mentioned, but it was built in 2019. 
The team started with few members from ORD and myself and grew to be 18 people as of this week. The team turned two years old just a couple of weeks back. As you can see in the slide, the team is built on four pillars that aligns to deliver on its mandate and feeds into OSFI's strategic goals and specific goal number two. So what do we do? On the next slide, you will see a high level summary of the different areas that TRD focuses on, from providing technology and cyber risk expertise to examine how both new and evolving technology and digital innovation might impact the financial institution resiliency, to dealing with technology and cyber incidents and ensuring our financial institutions are managing their risks appropriately. This is done via a multitude of ways, like our supervisory reviews, monitoring, industry scans and studies. And currently we are thinking of other ways to assess our institutions, including looking at the different threat-led pen testing frameworks. I will talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. Next slide, please. In terms of guidance, as you heard from Teresa, OSFI will be issuing a technology and cyber guideline. Uh, we are currently in the drafting stages and targeting uh, for later this year uh, for consultation. So please stay tuned. We also plan to refresh our existing cyber self-assessment tool, which was originally published in 2013. And we are also refreshing our incident reporting advisory. One of the relatively new products that the team started issuing is what we call technology risk bulletins and threat intelligence bulletins. The technology risk bulletins are more geared and positions as supervisory expectations, and they tackle either teething problems like authentication or aim to support new technology advancement like API. We issued two technology risk bulletins so far, one on multi-factor authentication or MFA, and one on API security and risks. We are also looking at DLT or digital ledger technology, blockchain and quantum for future technology risk bulletin releases. Threat intelligence bulletin, on the other hand, are more timely and threat related. It is aimed to enhance our financial institution's cyber readiness by sharing some techniques, tactics and procedures and indicators of compromise from in incidents we receive via our advisory. One of the areas we are also looking at closely is the area of intelligence-led red teaming assessment. Some of you will be familiar with these frameworks in other jurisdictions like CBEST in the UK, Tiber in Europe, and many others. These type of assessments broaden the traditional way of supervisory reviews to more hands-on keyboard type assessments. This will enable us to elevate the industry cyber resilience and focus on the areas that capable and sophisticated attackers would target in our institutions. And finally, as mentioned also by Teresa, we published a third party infographic that summarizes the work we've done on third party in 2019. Next slide, please. This slide talks about the continuous pace of digital innovation in the industry. Whether you call it digitization, digitalization, or innovation, it is moving fast and changing rapidly. As these move closer to home and institutions embark on journeys related to digitalization, OSFI is also looking at these areas from a risk management perspective. Open finance, while the open banking file is driven by Department of Finance, we want to look at beyond open banking and into open finance and open data. This could have interesting implication to the insurance industry as it evolves and develops. Innovation in the blockchain and digital ledger technology space with smart contracts is another one. Uh, I would also mention development in automation, RPA, AI, ML as areas of, of development and involvement in the insurance space. Now shifting gears to the cyber sphere, I imagine all of you heard about the oil, pi oil pipeline colonial that was hit with ransomware and the interesting details around it. Uh, the breach apparently occurred via a reused password, which was exposed in another breach. Also, additionally, this week, the DOJ in the US announced that they were able to suspend some of the funds of the ransom. While it shows that there is a heightened focus on this and amazing amount of efforts on the law enforcement side, it also shows a lack of OPSEC or operational security from the attacker side. Moving closer to our industry in March, the eighth largest insurance company in the US was also hit with a ransomware that took their system offline for close to a month. And as mentioned in public news outlets, the ransom was paid, and if I'm not mistaken, 
it is one of the highest, if not the highest paid ransom. And this leads me to my next slide. What have we seen in terms of themes and trends in the cyber threat landscape this past year? One word that dominates and that is ransomware. While our financial institution fared well against this threat, I can't say the same for their third parties and fourth parties. And speaking of which, supply chain attacks these past few months have been continuously making headlines. We all heard about SolarWinds, Acilion, Mimecast, Microsoft, and in my honest opinion, one is, that is underrated is the CodeCov breach. Attackers are focusing more than ever on the trusted supplier. Even as you think of cloud to be the safer, secure place, researcher this week discovered malware that targets cloud containers. Aside of what I mentioned, we continue to see the typical phishing campaigns. And during COVID, they switched to using COVID-themed lures. Our financial institution continued to experience uh, account takeover attacks and credential stuffing. Uh, and for a small period last summer, we saw uh, DDoS for ransom or DDoS alongside extortion emails. Uh, and that was a, an interesting trend because it appeared again back in 2017. How did the above translate into our own backyard? Well, uh, throughout the year and up to last month, we received a total of 76 incidents reports via our tech and cyber incident advisory. Just under 20% of these were reported from the insurance sector. The incidents varied from third-party breaches to DDoS attacks. We received incidents involving a whaling attack and we received one involved a phishing aimed at stealing credential. Again, however, as you would have guessed by now, we received multiple incidents related to ransomware attacks. Of note, as what makes these attacks successful is lack of basic security controls or proper monitoring, lack of proper network segmentation, lack of backups, including testing those backups and securing the backups, data encryption at rest, endpoint detection, web filtering, and data leakage controls. Interestingly, this last one in specific is interesting as we continue to see the exfiltration not being detected by the DLP controls if they exist, and in some cases, the lack of DLP controls as a whole. On the technology side, as I finish off my last point in, my, in the last slide, we saw a rapid ramp up of work from home, which caused some network stability issues. However, the financial institutions were able to stabilize fairly quickly. Some of the risks that came up during last year and the pandemic even crystallized them more are technology currency and vulnerability and patch management, which we continue to see as a pain point across the whole industry rather than just in insurance. With that, I conclude my remarks and I will turn it back to Stuart and will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mo. That was an excellent presentation, and uh, I enjoyed all the presentations you've had so far. Hope that's likewise with our other attendees. This will, at this moment, we'll now begin our Q and A section. We have uh, we finished early, so there's lots of time for questions. So please enter them in Slido. At this moment, I will now turn it over to Sheila Catahan Niles who will read the questions from Slido that you have kindly sent to us and direct them to the appropriate speakers we have today. Over to you, Sheila. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, so I'll begin the first question. This one's a capital question, so I'm gonna direct this over to Thomas. The question is, will OSFI introduce transitional arrangements for capital in 2023? Great, thank you, Sheila. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I guess the, the the simple answer is it hasn't been determined yet. What we're looking at is we're, we're going to rely on the quiz three results to to, to inform that decision. Uh, what I can say is that the um, the idea of transitional arrangement is not off the table, uh, depending on where again where we land on uh, final numbers for for quiz three. Uh, we we will decide whether any transitional arrangements will be put in for 2023. Great. 
there's another capital question, Thomas. So the spotlight's on you. Um, the question is, for LICAT, has OSPI considered adjusting the interest rate risk component calculation itself rather than simply applying a brute force scalar adjustment? Great, thanks, Sheila. Thanks for the question. Um, what we want to do with the LICAT in terms of the objectives for 2023, again, is to have insurers focus on the implementation of IFRS, IFRS 17. So while we did consider um, some additional adjustments to the uh, interest rate risk calculation, uh, we found that the, the scaler would, would, would get us to the objective of, or help get us to the objective of neutrality. Now, that being said, um, you know, with every policy that we, we, we have and we continue on reviewing it, and there will be opportunities to review the um, interest rate risk calculation beyond 2023 as we review all policies. And there, you know, at, at that point, it'll give us a little bit more time to better understand what changes would be appropriate to the IRR calculation and consider all the, um, the consequences of making, uh, making changes. Great, thank you, Thomas. The next question is for Teresa. When do you expect the new guideline B10 to be final effective? Okay, thank you for the question. And I know B10 is, um, is, is a hot topic and people are waiting for it. Um, so we are beginning work. Um, as I mentioned, we had received quite a bit of feedback on uh, B10 and outsourcing and third party sort of management generally with the tech risk discussion paper. Uh, we expect to release draft guidance in early 2022. Uh, and then we'll probably have about a 12 week consultation period on uh, the draft. Then there'll be a few months of us reviewing it. Uh, we also have to consider other work that we have ongoing such as tech risk and, and certain sort of linkages uh, that might occur while we're working on other areas like operational resilience and tech risk. Uh, so we would uh, likely expect to have final guidance uh, later in 2022, depending again on the amount of feedback that we receive and the type of feedback we receive and the time it takes us to work through that. But um, at least you should see an indication of what we're thinking about with respect to uh, outsourcing in third party in early 2022. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Teresa. The next question is an IFRS 17 question. So I'm gonna direct this over to David. Um, the question is, in terms of IFRS 17 deliverables, there was mention of a milestone in June 2022. Can OSFI provide more information around the June 2022 milestone submission? Uh, thank you, great question. Um, so the, in 2022, we're gonna run a test run. So uh, the final quiz will have been uh, done we will have finalized the uh, the like guideline uh, and so that would be published and so we would expect all institutions to then use that final guideline uh, in their 2020 submission with a 20 year end and so that will be a test run potentially through our rss system through our supervision system and so it'll be a posting of data. So that, that will be a, a mock uh, uh, Q1 2020 run with uh, uh, 21 data. Um, so that's, that's the objective. I know, Tom, do you wanna add anything to that on that, uh, on, that, on that test run? No, I think that summarizes it pretty well. Thanks, David. Great, um, thanks, David. There is another uh, IFRS 17 question, so I'm gonna direct it to you again. Uh, what do you expect to be the biggest pressure point driven by FRS 17 for institutions in the next six months? Uh, so that's a, another great question. So in, it will be stressful in the next six months. So uh, six months from now, we're into audit quality comparable data. So we're into financial statements that will be audit quality that will have to be presented in 2023. So in six months, institutions will either have to be preparing IFRS 17 financials or will have to be in 2023, trying to redo the quarter Q1 22 
to get comparable data side by side. So in six months, like within the next six months, during prepare this quiz, uh, we should have uh, final accounting policies, uh, uh, near final systems, near final processes, uh, in order to prepare for those those financial statements. It is going to be a very stressful next six months on the I for seventeen landscape for institutions. And so we hope that quiz kind of level set the industry towards that. So the quiz will be highlight some of those concerns, those accounting uh, policy that have to be made uh, um, the next little bit. I know Tom, do, uh, I probably scared the industry, but I know Tom, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, I think the, the only thing I would add to that, David, is I think from a capital perspective that the model, modeling will still be, still be a challenge. Um, throughout the, the year for, for IFRS 17, uh, specifically in the areas of market consistent valuations using stochastic models. Um, it is for that reason that um, in some areas of the LICAT or some of, of our planned work, i.e. Um, implementing a new approach for the segregated fund guarantees, we decided to defer that um, uh, for, um, for for two years and then implement a, a stopgap measure between the time. So we're, we're you know, we're recognizing that um, in this area, it's fairly new for institutions. There's still a lot of work to be done to come up to the IFRS 17 modeling. And we're, we're providing a little bit more flexibility there for, uh, in order to uh, ensure us to implement in a robust way by 2023. Okay, great. And, and just... So the, the quiz is very important for, for not only for OSPE in terms of the data coming back, but I think for the institutions to do that analysis of their and do pro forma financial statements at this time to see if there is a hole, is there, a, is there an accounting policy hole that they need to plug up before they go live? Because we are very close to moving to live. Um, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, David and Thomas. I'll go to the next question. Um, it's again, uh, IFRS 17. So I'll direct it to both David and Thomas. Um, the question is regarding Q, uh, QIS number three, would you consider accepting expected IFRS 17, IFRS four income for 2021 instead? Much less effort versus actual income and aligns with QIS number three transition dates. Uh, so, so 2021 is not over yet, so uh, so that doesn't work because we can't have all institutions because then that would be a, a projection, not a pro forma. And so we, ha we have um, chosen to use 2020 data, which is audited IFRS 4, IFRS 9 versus uh, the pro forma. And so that's why 2021 data just, just wouldn't work. As we add up the entire industry, it just... Uh, just wouldn't make sense because that's a, a forecast and it's hard to compare against audited financial statements. I know Tom did. did uh... Nothing from my end, David. Thank you. Right. Um, another IFRS 17 question. IFRS timelines are aligned with December year-end organizations. Project timelines for October year-end organizations will have a lag. Will OSFI acknowledge there is likely more work to do regarding QIS? David? Okay, so so on, on that one, so uh, it sounds like we're talking about the bank owned insurers versus the, the uh, the rest in years at the year end versus uh, versus uh, uh, October year end uh, is so we're requiring all insurers to file their quiz at the same time in September um, in September. So the if a, if an insurer has an October year end, uh, then they would file October uh, 2020 versus uh, the pro forma or for cyber 17 October 2020. And we would expect that in September. So the the uh, we want to add up the entire industry uh, for the 2020 year end filing, so that we can un understand what happened top line, bottom line, and financial strength in terms of what's moving on the equity, uh, what's moving in equity, especially uh, between the two standards. Okay. 
Thank you, David. Uh, the next question is for Teresa. Did you mention guideline E4 and the expected release date of the final guideline? Yeah, thanks, Sheila. So E4, you'll recall we had issued draft, uh, draft guidance in the fall. And I'm pleased to say uh, we are expected to release the final guideline at the end of this month. Thanks. Great. Thank you. The next question um, I will direct to Teresa or Mo as it's related to non-financial risk. Um, but Teresa, I'll direct it to you first. How much work is being done to coordinate regulatory efforts domestically and internationally to address non-financial risks? Sure, yeah, thanks, Sheila. That's a really good question. And I, I think uh, it's very pertinent because coordination today, uh, particularly for these risks that, you know, no, no boundaries and, uh, you know, no, no limits, uh, coordination is, is really important. So a couple of points. So as mem OSFI is a member of FSB, BCBS and IIS. And so we follow developments of the international standard setters very closely. In some cases, we are members of critical uh, working groups on non-financial risks as well as financial risk. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is we are currently on a working group for operational resilience. Um, so as such, we are part of the policy development process. Uh, we also obviously represent Canada's sort of voice and view on many of these fora. Uh, further, we monitor uh, developments in other jurisdictions, particularly those with similar regulatory approaches as Canada, where we might be able to glean, uh, you know, some, some sort of valuable insights into our own approaches. What comes to mind is APRA in Australia and the PRA in the UK. Uh, we often work with our international counterparts in understanding each other regimes and challenges. Um, and finally, we work with our provincial authorities, very important, either bilaterally or through various fora, the heads of agencies, CAPSA, um, the CCIRA, in discussing and assessing domestic best practices in the non-financial risk management areas. So Mo, I don't know if, um, I know sometimes TRD is part of other working groups, both uh, provincially and internationally. Did you wanna say a few words? Uh, sure, thanks, Teresa. And yeah, you pretty much covered it well. I think one aspect, uh, maybe not in the regulatory side, but on the supervisory side, we're also part of supervisory groups like the senior supervisory group who has, again, multiple jurisdiction internationally where we talk about new supervisory techniques or tools uh, to, to look at these non-financial risks. And we are active participant in, in that group. Uh, additionally, again, as Teresa mentioned, uh, uh, locally, we, we're, we're attached with multiple provincial uh, regulators, but also agencies, uh, especially with focus on the cyber threat landscape, cyber risks, etc. So hope that helps answer this. It does. Thank you, Mo and Teresa. The next question is the climate risk question. So I'm gonna direct this over to Stefan. As a regular uh, regulator of global companies domiciled here and Canadian institu uh, institutions, how does OSFI think of climate risks and their mitigants in the Canadian context? Um, thank you, Sheila. That's a very good question. Um, I was just actually just relaxing here as everybody, all my colleagues were getting the hard questions and now someone threw, uh, threw me uh, a hard question. Um, so let me just think about this. So, you know, countries, it's a good question because countries have different economies and, and, and geographies and their exposures to climate risks are gonna uh, be different and, and, and require different responses. And Canada is, 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 is no different, right? We have uh, a vast geography um, we're almost like a little, a little globe, right? We have, we have uh, entire parts of the country that are specialized in, in fossil fuels productions, and we've got other parts of the country that have no fossil fuels at all or, or no carbon, carbon industries at all. Um, and we have parts of the country that are specialized in agriculture and other parts that don't. So it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it, it's, the Canadian context is very, very important. And it's, and I think, I think I would turn the question back to the industry and say it's very important for institutions to uh, consider this context of, of, of our Canadian economy and our Canadian industries when they're looking at the impact of, of transition risks 
uh, and how best to manage it. And, and the work that we're doing with the Bank of Canada, the, 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 those macroeconomic scenarios are exactly looking at that. You know, they're looking at, uh, they're shocking different sectors of the economy, uh, oil and gas, um, extraction sections, agriculture, cement production, uh, and then looking at the, how those translate into uh, the in, how they get impacted down to the borrower level or different uh, company levels. Um, but, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, OSFI's uh, interest here is, is really prudential, right? We want to make sure that institutions are responding to these risks, that they maintain adequate capital uh, while, while continuing to take reasonable risks. And that includes their operations here, here in Canada. And I think it's also important to say that as the economy transitions, it's not all going to be negative, right? There's, you know, companies have to consider that there's going to be some, uh, some positive uh, implications to this transition as well. Uh, this transition is going to create new economic opportunities. And um, we can hope that some of that overall impact may actually be positive. Uh, I guess it just depends, as I mentioned earlier, the timing of that transition, but there's there's a lot of literature that says that the transition may actually be positive to the economy. And I think finally, uh, the last thing that comes to mind is that we, we should not underestimate uh, the Canadian financial institution sector, uh, uh, their capacity to adapt to radical changes and circumstances. You know, we have a, a financial sector that came out of a, you know, one of the worst economic downturns in 2008. Uh, and you see how the financial sector has responded in the last uh, 12 to 14 months uh, following the pandemic. So we have a very, very resilient sector. Uh, and I think uh, our, they're well, uh, well prepared to sort of guard against these unknowns and, and unknown you know, possible risks around climate risks and change. But so I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I think you know, we, 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 we are definitely sensitive to the Canadian context. Uh, and we will be incorporating that in our in our prudential, uh, uh, you know, expectations and our in our response. Okay, great. Thank you, Stefan. The next question is for Mo. Um, the question is, why not combat ransomware by making it illegal to pay ransom? I guess you'd, you'd also have to regulate away the related insurance. Very interesting question. Uh, I'm, I'm smiling. I and I wish it's it's that easy. I think from our perspective at OSFI, this kind of goes be, beyond our mandate of what we're looking for. And I would like to actually probably make it uh, on the flip side or the other side of the fence is if you had, you know, if institution focused on having proper controls and risk management, similar to what I mentioned in my remarks, hopefully you'll never get to a point where you have to, to pay the ransom. Again, paying the ransom is basically when you reach to a point where all fails and you have no other option but to pay the ransom. And that's usually due to controls not existing or, or failing of such controls. Uh, so I think from our perspective and where we focus on and our mandate is to ensure that our institution have these proper controls in place and proper risk management practices. Uh, I, I will try to steer away from, again, making illegal or legal for paying the ransom. There's a lot of efforts happening, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in Canada and beyond. But uh, to me, my focus would be always on risk management and, and controls. Uh, I'm not sure if Teresa has anything else to add here. Great. Um, I think that's good, Mo. I'll, I'll go to the next question, which I believe will be addressed to Teresa. Maybe you could uh, respond to this first, and then we'll coordinate it whether or not Mo um, wants to respond as well. Uh, the question is, how are the rest of the federal government's initiative, initiatives changing OSFI's approach? Thanks, Sheila. And sorry about the last question. I couldn't find my mute button. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, I, and I didn't have anything to add to, Mo did a good job of answering that question. But for this question, I can sort of um, tie it to what Mo said. So, I, you know, initiatives, there are a lot of initiatives. I'm not really sure what the question, which initiatives the question uh, wanted to focus on. We have tech initiatives, we have cyber initiatives, um, you know, all sorts of initiatives. So, but what I can say is obviously we, um, we operate and we, you know, we, 
we think about what is happening in the context around us, uh, and we certainly coordinate with other agencies to better understand, you know, their strategic priorities. Uh, what is what are their concerns? But ultimately, as Mo said, we are the prudential regulator. Uh, we're an independent agency, and so we will take these other initiatives into consideration. But um, ultimately, we will look at the risk management frameworks, the policies and procedures our institutions have in place, and how well those mitigate uh, risks that we consider important. Uh, now, some of our identification of risk obviously might be influenced by, you know, different initiatives happening either internationally or domestically. Um, but ultimately, all of that would be looked at through a prudential lens. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Mo, did you have anything else to add with that? Or no, you're okay. I'm okay. All right. So the next question is actually for you, Mo. Um, it's regarding tech and cyber in the risk sections. What is meant by loss of data at endpoints? Um, great and like very keen eye for whoever picked that up. So. Uh, you know, kudos and hat tip. I think from our perspective, what we meant to, especially that uh, something we noticed, again, as the pandemic was ramping up and work from home uh, was expanding, we noticed that, again, the controls that you would usually have in institutions ground might not translate to when people moved to home printing, uh, you know, using maybe personal devices rather than uh, uh, issued laptops from the organization have different different levels of controls and might not align to the controls at the institution. And that could expose uh, institution to data loss and data leakage. I hope that clarifies it. Okay, great. Thanks, Mo. The next question, I'm going to direct it over to Teresa. Um, it would be helpful to understand how OSFI's work is tied into other gov government regulators agencies. Okay, thanks, Sheila. Yeah, I, you know, I think some of this has already been answered in some of the questions that we've already um, responded to. Um, OSFI you know, is a member of uh, a lot of different uh, working groups, both at the federal, provincial, international level. Uh, so there is, you know, a, a considerable amount of coordination that happens. Uh, we're always very interested in what other agencies and governments internationally are concerned about, uh, where they're focusing their attention on. Uh, but ultimately, as we've, we've already said, as the prudential regulator, uh, we will look at any of those risks uh, from a prudential uh, lens. Uh, and looking at our institutions as to how they have built, uh, you know, adequate risk management frameworks to deal with any of those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Sheila, I, can yes. I add uh, some comments uh, to that question as Absolutely. well as it pertains to climate? Yep. So uh, just, just from a climate risk perspective, um, under, you know, uh, we deal with a lot of, uh, of our federal government and provincial government counterparts. Um, you know, the, the government of Canada has a, a, a net zero uh, emissions 2050 target. Uh, they have a carbon pricing policy. Um, so, you know, we're obviously, you know, in, in, uh, tied in with the, the Ministry of Environment, Department of Finance uh, around how those are gonna unfold and, and uh, the impacts on the financial sector. Um, we also work very closely with obviously the Bank of Canada uh, on the scenario pilot uh, and on financial stability issues. Um, so we work closely with the Bank of Canada. We work very closely with the Department of Finance uh, as they were setting up the Sustainable Finance Action Council that is uh, that has just stood up. Uh, that's another example. Um, OSFI is also a member of the Canadian Association of Pension. Supervisory authorities, uh, CAPSA. Uh, we're a member of that. I think. I think our our, our representative is also a co-chair, and and that committee is looking at you know incorporating uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, issues into uh, pension investment decisions. So those are just some examples where, on the climate file, I can tell you from my perspective, uh, we have um, relationships with a lot of other federal. Uh, agencies as well as provincial agencies and and uh, provincial securities regulators for example on the disclosure on the disclosure topic right thanks Thank Stefan 
Um, the last question here is, um, which we have is for IFRS 17, which I'm going to direct to David. IFRS IFRS 17 requires insurers use a market consistent approach, but smaller companies may not have these models. What is OSFI's approach for small FIs? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so the, F, the FI container, the reason why OSFI didn't issue accounting policies is because the FI, we wanted to allow the FI to tailor their accounting policies uh, depending on their, their size and complexity and the products. So IFR 17 allows for a top-down approach to, to discount rate or, or discount a bottom-up approach to discount discounting. So I would recommend the institution look at these different options with their auditor and uh, then assess what approach is appropriate for them. So sometimes that will be enough to decide, okay, I have to, I want to use a simplified approach and uh, that approach would mean I would have to use a top-down approach and my assets would look a certain way. And therefore, a similar result as what I have now based on that. So I, I would recommend the institution look at that, at that and talk to their auditor in terms of what choices uh, do I have and what restrictions would I have to do in order to produce relevant and reliable financial statements. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Um, from looking at the slides, it looks like that's the last question. So um, I will uh, forward back the mic to Stuart for his closing remarks. Stuart. All right, thank you, Sheila. Thanks to uh, everyone that attended today's webcast uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. I'd like to thank all of the presenters today for their excellent presentations and response to the questions we had. Um, also, this wouldn't be possible without the other hidden OSFI colleagues who helped organize this event in the background. I hope you found the sessions informative and now have a clearer picture of what OSFI is focusing on and the direction we're heading. The questions from the audience were insightful. We welcome the questions from the industry. They do help us uh, in our work as we get to know what the issues are you face each day. There's a, there was naturally a lot of questions concerning the change over to IFRS 17 and related capital impacts and requested test runs. Naturally, you would have those questions. While we only hold these seminars once a year, we are committed to continuing discussions with you. I encourage you to keep your eyes open for that coming consultations like today, or you can raise a question with your supervisor. This afternoon, you will receive an online evaluation by email asking for feedback. Your input is important to us. So please take a few moments and let us know what you liked about today's session, how we can improve, or any ideas you have that we could incorporate for our next session. This webcast is for you. So please take this opportunity to let us know what you want out of these webcasts. The recording for today's session will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. I hope you come back for a rerun. We will email you a link when it is ready for viewing. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.